Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I want to open up this video with a little bit of an apology. Um, I know that I promised you guys a longer form, more research based video earlier this week. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, I was looking into how the United States and the Europeans, how a lot of their environmental policy is keeping the developing world underdeveloped and poor. And so, of course, I had to look into the DDT crisis in the 1960s and 70s and how the banning of DDT affected malaria numbers in the developing world and how it may have contributed to a resurgence. And then I started getting into all the research about whether DDT really was dangerous, whether it wasn't dangerous, is it carcinogenic or not, is it uh, da damaging to birds or to their eggshells or not. And I couldn't find like a clear consensus because all the, the doom saying is from the 1970s and then you have people from the 1960s and 70s the saying no it was actually safe um, people who were entomologists um, and people who were chemists working for chemical companies saying it was safe and then the environmentalists saying it's not safe and then nobody seems to have really cared since like the 2000s there's been a few people that have kind of adamantly continued to say no ddt is safe entomologists chemists um different different uh, people but they seem to think it's safe and nobody's really bothered to check so far as i can tell like there hasn't been a lot of study on ddt since the 1960s or 70s and so because of that i couldn't really make heads or tails of whether or not it's safe or not um you know, it, it, it was everything was basically the opposite of what the other side was saying. DDT caused pelicans to have thin eggshells and almost made them go extinct. Actually, DDT was perfectly safe, and it was uh, oil spills and lead that caused those pelicans to have thinner shells. You know, things like that. I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it, so I'd like to put that video on hold kind of indefinitely right now perhaps talk to some chemists and to some entomologists or ornithologists. I do know some, I have access to that. Um, so maybe I can get a better picture as to what really happened, right? And whether it was really necessary to ban DDT or whether or not it was um, all just a big scare. And then I wanted to kind of tie all that into how the modern environmentalist movement kind of has this precautionary principle of saying the worst is going to happen in an effort to affect public policy, which can sometimes be co-opted by um, companies to use as uh, environmental excuses as to why markets should be closed off to certain commodities and products from the developing world that are cheaper, so like palm oil, certain types of wood, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, because I can't definitively say like, whether DDT was not safe or was safe. Um, I just don't feel comfortable diving into that arena right now. So because of that today, I've decided to jump into something that is not controversial and is pretty easily understood, um, the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So today, according to reports, uh, there was a aid distribution center that was handing out bags of flour to Palestinians. Uh, many of them apparently got there you know, very early in the morning, like 4 a.m. to receive the flour, the food, and Israeli tanks and snipers opened fire on the crowd, killing about 104 people, injuring somewhere around 600. Of course, this has been met with outrage um, in the online community. Twitter is exploding with uh, the hashtag flower massacre. And so now I'm not going to get up here and condemn Israel and say how horrible, how awful, how could they possibly do this? Um, one, because it's not really a surprise that they did this, right? Um, because they've been doing this the entire war, they've been doing this for decades. I feel like we all know that what Israel's doing is not really right, um, but to me humanitarian arguments, appeals to emotion and like that have never really worked that well on me um not that i'm not sympathetic and don't care it's just that i feel like sometimes it's it's not helpful you end up following bad arguments because you're like oh well look at these crying people therefore we should x and it's like well i don't know if that's really the case now many people online have been saying that this is all part of israel's continued genocidal war against the palestinians i wouldn't call it genocide um i think that that word has kind of too broad and I think that it's been used so much that it's almost lost its meaning even though it has like a specific definition um, as, as listed by the UN but I feel like this is probably more tantamount to ethnic cleansing 
we want to get like really technical about it but regardless i think it is clear that israel wants the palestinians out of what would be considered the greater israel area so that's Israel, and then including the West Bank, and uh, then Gaza. Israel is in a predicament. All their neighbors hate them. Um, they are a small country. They are almost entirely dependent on the goodwill of foreign countries. And for a very long time, they had that in spades, right? As kind of the successor to the Jewish people, who, you know, coming out of the 20th century, had a pretty tough go of it, right? the Holocaust, all that. Um, they were really able to build up this like unconditional well of support from the Americans and from the West. But I think that's starting to run dry, probably in part because World War II was 80 years ago. Most of the people are dead. Um, our education system's pretty poor. A lot of people don't even know what the Holocaust is anymore. And so I think that they've lost a lot of public support because of that. But then also because of their actions, I think that that unconditional support turned them into kind of a spoiled child, thinking that they could do whatever they want because they basically could. I mean, they attacked an American ship and killed, I forget how many, a few dozen of our sailors once, and we didn't do anything. We just kept on giving them support um, because we just are, are totally in bed with Israel. We have this like unprecedented, unheard of relationship with Israel between the Israelis and the United States. That all has to do with like the Israeli lobby in this country. I'm not going to get into that right now, but you could read John Mersheimer's book on that if you're really interested. So Israel does whatever they want for about 70, 80 years. Um, but all of a sudden, only in the last couple of years has that well of goodwill really started to dry up. You've had pro-Palestinian movements in the past, but I've never seen kind of the open you know, I wouldn't say anti-Semitic, but anti-Zionist sentiment that's just kind of sweeping all over the world. Uh, I, you know, I have people who I know, friends who I, I knew in college or people who are still in college, especially women. It's the women who are really on this, um, you know, calling Israel an apartheid state, calling them a uh, colonial state, calling for the end of Zionist occupation of Palestinian territory. These are just like you know, white women from the suburbs that are <laughs> chanting these slogans. So Israel's really in a bit of a bind here. They are absolutely an apartheid state. Like, I don't think there should really be any question about that. They don't offer full citizenship rights, full voting rights to non-Israelis in their territory. Um, and that's partially why they keep Gaza and the West Bank kind of separated because they don't want those people being able to vote in elections because the Arabs outnumber the Israelis by a small margin, but that margin is going to continue to grow. The Arabs are having many, many more children than the Israeli Jews are, um, especially the secular Israeli Jews. And so you would, you would basically have a South Africa situation where, you know, of course, if you let the majority population vote, they're gonna vote you out of power. Israel was a pretty strong ally to Rhodesia and South Africa until they were pressured to stop. And so they kind of know where this goes. They know where this line goes. But I don't really know what they're going to be able to do about it. Because just like Rhodesia and South Africa collapsed under the weight of being shunned by the whole world, I think Israel's starting to get to that position. They're becoming a pariah. They have a large population that's hostile to them living in their territory. They've occupied them for decades and occupying forces almost always become corrupted because in order to really occupy a territory you need to see them as lesser in some way and so that's why you have these kind of war crime tiktoks these israeli soldiers that are really making fun of the people that they're oppressing or that they've killed or, or imprisoning at times they openly defy their military's message about protecting civilians <laughs> and film themselves destroying civilian shops. Israel is under increasing scrutiny over the war in Gaza. These videos may well be adding fuel to that criticism. Um, pretty brutal stuff to just be blatantly posting on Instagram and TikTok. But I don't really know what you can do if you're Israel at this point. You certainly can't give all these people rights. You can't, you know, integrate Gaza and the West Bank into Israel. Um, you can't, it seems, just 
get rid of these people like you can't just deport them somewhere else find another country for them to go because nobody really seems to want them Egypt certainly doesn't want them Jordan won't take them uh, if you had done that 70 years ago just said no Palestinians allowed this is a this is an ethno state of Jewish people you know the whole world probably would have let you get away with that back in 1947 but I just don't know if they didn't have the capacity or they just didn't have the will or what 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 reasoning that they chose not to but they didn't um, and so now they have this you know, horrible, horrible situation, this huge pain that I just don't see what they do to overcome it. And, you know, you can't just exterminate these people because I, I don't think that the world will go for that. They've been pretty tolerant of Israelis' abuse of the Palestinians for a very long time, even right now. But with this massacre, I, I see them losing even more support. They basically lost the PR war. And they've lost the next generation. I think that's key. They've they've definitely lost like the under 30 generation of people. You know, being pro-Palestinian is kind of almost a necessity, especially on the left. I think on the right, at least in this country, they may still have some supports. Uh, the Republicans are very supportive of Israel. But, you know, even in the young people, everyone's kind of like, this is you know, kind of messed up. If I was Israeli, I would probably be looking for an exit. I would be making sure that I had all my affairs in order so that if in the future things continue to deteriorate, if foreign aid gets shut off, if the, an influx of Palestinians continues to come into the country, if the, you know, the demographics start going south, whatever the case may be, I, I would want to be able to get on a plane and go somewhere else, somewhere safe. Um, because I don't think that Israel exists as a state in its current form by like 2050. You, it's definitely not till 2100. Like Israel is not a long-term solution for where Jewish people can go and live because they they had to choose the most hostile environment to them on the planet. Um, and you know they say they have historical precedent for that, historical reasons. I don't buy that. I mean, they were they were maybe in Israel 2,000 years ago, and then it's an open question about whether the modern Jews are really even related to the ancient Israelites. Um, probably wasn't a great idea to go move into that area of the world, but uh, that wasn't that wasn't my decision. Yeah, I mean, you have American servicemen setting themselves on fire outside the Israeli embassy, protesting Israel's occupation of Gaza. Now, you could say this guy was mentally ill, or he was a lefty, or whatever, or that it didn't mean anything, but I don't think that that's true either. I have seen all over Instagram, and these are not bot accounts, I mean, these are people that I know personally, lefties, again, mostly women, but they're like, oh, well, we will never forget your name, uh, I forgot his name, <laughs> but, you know, you will always be remembered. Um, you know, self-immolation actually does seem to be like a pretty effective form of protest because you think people would be like, oh, like he killed himself, but it, it turns you into a martyr. It, for some reason within our, our human psychology, when somebody sets themselves on fire because they're upset at somebody else, we blame the person that they were upset at. I, I can't figure that one out, but that does seem to be the case. Um, definitely not advocating for self-immolation. Don't set yourself on fire, please. But, you know, I think that this massacre and this, uh, this self-immolation by an American serviceman, I think that will actually have a, an effect. I think it may take a little while to see that, but I think that when you look back at the history books, like these two events will certainly be in it. And I think they will both be considered at least catalysts to whatever is coming next. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, so the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I, I don't know how Israel ends it. It's kind of like the Ukraine-Russia war. Like, even if you wanted to pull out, how do you stop? Because you're both sides are facing an existential threat from the other, and so it really becomes like a fight for survival. Uh, it's, it's a blood feud, and there's no real good way out of it. Israel's certainly not going to exterminate Hamas. They, they've only killed a couple thousand Hamas fighters total. Um, there are tens of thousands of people in Hamas. There are hundreds of thousands of collaborators. It's a pretty popular movement within Gaza. And I try to I try to explain this to people. I try to explain it to like my boomer dad and to other boomers and people. And 
I'm always met with, well, if the people just realize that, uh, you know, the reason they're being bombed is because Hamas keeps on attacking Israel, then they, sh they would just turn on Hamas. And like, that's just the strategic bombing argument and it, and it doesn't work, right? The Germans believed that in World War I when they were bombing London. Um, they believed it again in World War II. The Americans and the British believed it in World War II. The right, like everybody was doing this during the World Wars, thinking if you bomb out the civilian populations of your enemy, then they will turn on the enemy and uh, they will uh, be a popular uprising and, and bada big bada boom makes it easier to invade. Well, strategic bombing theory has been proven over and over and over not to be effective because when you bomb a civilian population, they don't get mad at their leaders, they get mad at you because you're the one dropping the bombs. You know, people are smart enough to figure that out. It's harder to go a couple layers deeper, like, oh, well, if only we hadn't continued the war, then we wouldn't be being bombed. And they, they're not thinking about that because who's there to clean up the mess? You know, who's there to bury the dead, to administer the aid, to uh, distribute food and to rebuild? It's not the, the RAF or the American army, it's the German army, you know, in this case of World War II, or in this case, it's Hamas, right? Israel's not coming to help build stuff. They're bulldozing neighborhoods. It's Hamas that comes in and, and is rebuilding. You know, they have a whole humanitarian wing. So, you know, they, of course, they have popular support. And so you're never going to be able to just root them out. It's not, a, it's not an issue of that. It's not a, a political party that just needs to be stamped out, right? You can't de Hamasify Gaza. It's like a popular uprising. So it's really a, a titanic struggle of survival going on in Israel and Palestine right now. Only one of them can survive, right? Either the Israelis need to wipe out or move out all the Palestinians, or the Palestinians are going to need to wipe out or remove all the Israelis. Like there is no uh, peaceful solution. There's no two-state solution. I think we're far beyond that. This really is a fight to the death and my money is on Hamas. Um, you know, that's not a endorsement of Hamas. That's just, I think, an assessment of the reality. I think this plays out in the same way that uh, the Bush War did, right? The Rhodesians won every single engagement that they had with the communist rebels in uh, Rhodesia. And it didn't matter because they were cut off from the international community. They didn't have enough support. They were not able to maintain the border areas. You know, farmers and civilians were being massacred by these uh, African communist guerrilla groups. And so many, many people left. They went to South Africa. They went maybe back to their, their roots in uh, Europe. They, they moved to Australia. They moved all over. And so you lost population. You lost popular support. The people, the government couldn't uh, sustain the economy anymore because they were cut off from the outside world. And so they had to capitulate. They had to have open elections. And then the communists took over. And then Rhodesia turned into Zimbabwe. And, and we all know how that worked out. So I think that's probably the fate of Israel. Um, and again, that's not a, an endorsement of Hamas. That's not even a condemnation of Israel. I think that's just a fair reading of the current events as they as they stand right now. Um, Israel does not make it into the next century. I, I think there's no there's no way that that's possible. Whatever the long term implications this war has, it's going to be a while before we see that because this this conflict's not going to end anytime soon. We probably have another year or two out of this. Certainly not until we have uh, the presidential election here in the United States. I don't. Joe Biden's certainly not going to withhold support from Israel at this point. He's not going to try to, I think, compel them to change their strategy here or to come to terms with Hamas, have a ceasefire. Um, but he's also not backing them to the hilt uh, in the same way that we have in the past, right? So Israel's kind of in this limbo, I think, with the American government, American population. Um, and it'll be yet to be seen what happens depending on who the next president is how they want to, you know, continue the policy of American-Israeli relations. Thank you so much for tuning in and hearing what I have to say about this. Feel free to let me know what you think in the comments. Um, and if you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and uh, I will catch you guys on the next one.